Hello there. Before we get started on today's episode, I'd like to ask a short favor. If you're interested in either of the two books that I have written and I'm about to release, head on over to my website at theanxioustruth.com slash books. There you can learn about both books, one of which is free, and you can get on my mailing list to be notified when each book is released and how you can get it. I would really appreciate that. Okay, let's get rolling. Hey, what's up, dudes and dudettes? Drew here. Welcome to episode 91 of The Anxious Truth. I'm really happy that you stopped by. Today, we're going to talk about worry. W-O-R-R-Y, the big W, worry and worrying. So many people have asked me to talk about this topic. I never would have envisioned five years ago when I started the podcast that I'd be like talking so much about the idea of worry and worrying, but here I am. This won't be super long because there's not a whole lot to say about worrying. It's pretty cut and dry, and I think hopefully I'll be able to give you some some info that will help you and maybe a direction that you can go into it to address that issue if you are a chronic worrier and if the idea of worry and worrying is just driving you crazy and just driving you into a really negative place with respect to your anxiety and fear problems. Um, there's not a whole lot to say about it, but I think what there is to say sometimes is real like a revelation to people who hear it. So I'll throw it all out there. Let's get rolling. So I, the first thing I want you to do is to understand what worry actually is. And I'm just going to give you like really dry, unphilosophical, like factual stuff that you're just going to have to either accept or decide to not accept, but it matters. Worrying is just thinking. So thinking is nothing. So thinking does not create, alter, change, modify, predict, or otherwise like have an influence in the real world. It doesn't. Thinking by itself has no influence on reality, what happens in the real physical world that we inhabit. Thinking by itself is just this amorphous, like electrical, biochemical thing that happens in your brain that only you experience that actually doesn't do anything in the physical universe. And worry is just a form of thinking. That's all it is. Let's compare worry with planning, because this is something that confuses a lot of people. Planning is kind of an informed simulation that's followed by action. So let's take a really silly, like simple, mundane, daily thing that you might want to think about and plan for. Let's say you're having a problem with a bathroom in your house and you have to get a plumber to come in and fix it. And the plumber says, I'll be there on Thursday morning. In your head, you will build a plan around this. No problem. He says he's coming Thursday morning, which means I have to take off from work. I have to be here, whatever it happens to be. And before he comes, we're going to have to all use the downstairs bathroom, whatever that is. You think about what's going to happen. The bathroom is broken. The plumber comes on Thursday. What must we, we do while we're waiting for him to adapt to the broken bathroom? And then you may even throw in a contingency in your brain, which says, well, he could be unreliable sometimes. If he doesn't show up, what are we going to do then? That's thinking about the future with the intent of making an informed action plan. So planning is thinking accompanied by action, an action that you can actually take to change and create reality in some way, shape, or form. That's planning. Worry is the thinking part of it without the plan, without the action. So worry is merely thinking about the future. It's a plan that has no chance of ever succeeding or even being implemented because when you worry about something, you're generally in the what if mode. What if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? And the difference between worrying, which is really kind of unhealthy, and planning, which is a normal thing that most human beings do to some extent, is planning adds the other part of the equation. What if this happens? Then I will do this. But worry is the what if without, it's the if without the then. So if anybody's involved with like coding and programming, if then statements are a thing. If this happens, then do that. Worry is the if without the then. Because either you don't recognize that there is a then I will do this, or the then I, do, I will do this doesn't exist. There's a, it's an action that is not, you can't take. It's impossible to do. It's a thing that's impossible to change or address or prevent, whatever it happens to be. So Worry is just that thinking about the future and what might happen, especially if they are scary things that you don't want to happen. And you have you either forget the part where you have to then put in a plan of action to deal with what might happen or recognize that I am thinking about something that has no available action attached to it. I cannot take an action on this. So if I were to sit here and worry all day long, 
that an asteroid may smash into the Earth and extinguish all life on Earth, well, I can't do anything about that. So I, there, that's the if. What if an asteroid hits the Earth? There's no then. There's no, there's no then in that if-then flowchart because there's nothing I could do anyway. There's nothing any of us can do. But if I sit here and worry about like, oh my God, what happens if I get a flat tire on my way home? Well, I can turn that worry into a plan. So because then I have an action that will follow the if. I have a then. If I get a flat tire, then I will call roadside assistance. Or then I will pull over and put the spare on the car. Uh Uh-oh, I don't know how to put the spare on the car. Then I will watch a YouTube video to learn how to do it. Or then I will practice how to do it. So do you understand the difference between worrying, which has absolutely no action attached to it. It's just thinking by itself with no point and no bearing on the future or reality and planning, which is starts as the, as the same as worry, but then has an action item that goes after it that you can implement. That's the difference between worry and planning. And it really, the definition of worry is, is a plan without an action is really what worry is. So you're trying to keep yourself safe and be prepared from something that might happen or might not happen, except you forget the part where you have to take some action to create that safety or that protection or that response to this terrible thing that you're worried might happen. And in some cases, you just forget that you can take action. You feel powerless, even though you you do have power and you can take action, you just don't realize it. Or you're obsessing about a thing that you can take no action in response to, in which which many people do. And that's an uncertainty problem. We could talk about uncertainty in another episode, but worry is very heavily linked to the idea of uncertainty in life. Worry, many people get racked with worry because they are seeking uncertainty where none exists in life. So you have to recognize these things. You know, this is the nature of worry. It's tied very closely to thinking. It's tied very closely to planning, but it's thinking without the action attached to it. That's worry. So what does worry represent? Here's one of the problems that I see about people who call themselves warriors. People apply labels like, well, I'm just a warrior. I've always worried. That's just me. I worry about everything. There's two things I want to say about that. Number one is that that's not cast in stone, you know, and you maybe we can't be completely different people. We all have our kind of personality traits and and tendencies that we go to, but many things are changeable. When people suffer traumatic brain uh, injuries and wind up with completely different personalities, that sort of tells us something about how our brains work. Or people who like maybe undergo head trauma of some kind and have to relearn to do tasks that they used to know how to do. Like there's a tremendous amount of change that's possible in the human brain. So just the fact that you've spent the last 25 years of your life being a air quotes warrior, I'm just a warrior, doesn't mean you have to stay that way. There are ways that we can address these things and change them. They really are. So understand that you may be applying a label to yourself that does not have to be applied. Yeah, many people, when I say that, you know, they kind of give me that look where like the confused dog look and their head goes to the side like, I don't understand this. Well, that's it's as simple as that. Just because you have always been a warrior and you identify as that and you tell people you're that doesn't mean it has to continue to be, especially if I'm a warrior. It's terrible. If you tell me that you are a warrior and that it is causing major problems in your life that you would rather not be there, then maybe you got to follow that thought onto the next thing that says, maybe I got to find something to do to change this. So be aware of worry and warrior as a a self-applied label that doesn't have to be there. And the other thing about that label is this is super important. It goes back to my first point about how thinking and worrying doesn't change reality. Worry is not a substitute for planning. It's not a substitute for being prepared. And it's not an indicator of you as as the quality of your personality or your, your soul. So just telling everybody that you are a warrior, and believe me, this is something that I see all the time. Many, many people wrap themselves in the cloak of, I am a warrior. I just worry about everybody. Because they think that worrying about somebody actually makes them either a better person or it's what they're supposed to do. Like worry is not a substitute for love or caring. You can care about somebody without without worrying about them because worrying is something that only exists in your head. So when you become obsessed with worrying about what's going to happen to your children or your significant other or your family or your friends or whatever it happens to be, you are the only one who experiences that. Like let that sink in for just a second. When you worry about another person, you are the only person in the universe that actually experiences that. The person you are worried about 
does not experience that. You can tell them that they're wor- you're worried about them, but it would be a little bit more productive and probably straightforward just to say, I love you, and I would be really upset if something bad happened to you. Okay, I can. if you tell me that, then that tell I know that you love me and you would be really upset if something bad happened to me. That's a statement of fact, and I would understand what you're thinking. But when you just decide, well, I'm going to worry about you then, okay, thanks for worrying, I guess. And I, I can imply and infer that that means that you love me, I guess, or you care about me. But worrying is not required to as a sign that you are a loving, caring person. It's just not. Like you can love somebody, care somebody, and be concerned about them you know, in terms of their health and their future and want the best for them and want them to be around and be safe and be happy and healthy without being chronically worried about them. Because worry is something that only you experience. No, no other being in the universe at the moment is experiencing that sense of worry that you have in your head for your son or your daughter, for example, or your dog or your cat or your boss or your friend, whoever it happens to be. So you have to really understand that worry often is a self-applied, you know, I'm a worrier is a self-applied label. And often it's applied because people think that if they worry, it's an action. See, I'm worried about you. I, I'm your mom. I worry about you. Well, you're, you're somebody's mom or dad, and so you maybe can love them and care for them and be concerned about the outcome of actions that they take in their lives, but you don't have to be wracked with, with continuous worry, which is that thinking without a plan. There's nothing you could do anyway in certain instances, right? So understand that you are not required to be a warrior to be a caring, loving person. That does not make you a kind soul. It does not make you empathetic. It doesn't validate you as an empath. It doesn't, none of those things because you are the only person that experiences worry. It's in your head and no other place in the entire known universe. Worry only exists in your own head. So if you are worried about me right now, I would rather you don't do that and just tell me like, hey, I love you, dude. And I I don't want you to die in a car crash. Cool. That's, that's a really nice thing to say to me, and then you can move on. You're not required to continually think about it because I don't experience that, and it doesn't change my life in any way to know that you are worrying about me. So that's another like really kind of harsh fact about worrying that many people forget. Like there's that light bulb goes off that says, oh, my God, I, I can't believe that. I, yes, I have used worry as a symbol or a proof or validation of love, and that is simply not true. Worrying about somebody does not prove to the world that that you love them. Maybe you have to prove to yourself that you love them, and that's a whole different topic altogether, but that's that's a choice that you make. And so if you decide that I must worry incessantly about the other people in my life so that I know that I love them, well, that's a choice that you between you and you. But then you cannot call that horrible and debilitating. So be aware of all that. So what do we do? Let's talk about another type of worry that's super common. And this is the worry that's sort of attached to health anxiety for many, many people. It's the worry about, so some people worry about external events that are going to happen. You know, uh, literally things like natural disasters, public safety issues, attacks, wars, crime. Some people worry about what's going to happen to their loved ones, excuse me, their friend and their friends and family, their pets and whatnot. Some people worry about what's going to happen to them, and it may be events that happen to them, and I'll lump that in the first thing, sort of external events, crime, public safety, attacks, that sort of stuff, finances, losing losing a job or, or, you know, being in tough financial situation. People worry about those things, but people also worry about themselves and their own safety, sometimes based on health concerns. So worry is a huge, huge, huge component of health anxiety. And people will say to me all the time, like, well, I'm such a warrior that as soon as I hear that something, somebody else had a heart attack, now I have to worry that I might have a heart attack. But again, same rules apply, worrying that you are going to have a heart attack or worrying that you will get cancer or worrying that you will get the flu because your coworker had the flu doesn't actually stop you from getting the flu. If you were going to get the flu or have a heart attack or get cancer, it's going to happen whether you worry about it or not. So it is a pointless exercise mentally to go through to be racked with worry about your own health, right? Because worrying does not actually impact what is going to happen to you. It doesn't stop it from happening. It doesn't make it less or more likely. And you, you got to put your brain around that. So all the different forms of worry that we're talking about here, whether you're worried about an attack, a crime, your finances, whatever it is, in the end, understand what parts of those topics you can turn into a plan, and I mean a reasonable plan. You cannot plan for every possible contingency in the world, but what can I turn, can I turn any of my worry into a plan? 
and then go ahead and do that. If you can turn worry into an action plan, put it in place, rehearse it if you have to. That's what sports teams and like the military does, does, and there's nothing wrong with that. Even if you got to rehearse your plan, there's nothing wrong with that. But find the things that you worry about that you can turn into a plan, like an action plan, and then put that plan in place and rehearse it if you want to. That's totally okay. It's completely acceptable to do that. But the things that cannot be turned into a plan, now you got to take it. You got to learn to drop those. So let's get on to the next part of this, which is how do I stop worrying? Well, the first thing is what I just said. Try and turn some of your worry into an actionable plan. Put it in place and have it ready to go. But then once it's ready to go, it's ready to go. That's all you did. So if part of the way you're going to eliminate the excessive worrying in your life is to turn worry into a plan, once that plan is in place, everything, the pieces are there, everybody's set, and you know, you've rehearsed it if you must or whatever it is, you've been through your drills or whatever it is you want to do, your simulations, you're done. That's it. It's, it's ready to go. You want to go back and like rehearse changing a tire on your car every three months? Knock yourself out. That's fine. But you change the tire and then you're done with that for the next three months. You got to, you got to get in that habit. But the things that cannot become a plan, the things that you worry about over which you will have no control and for which there is actually no reaction, that's a different animal. That has to do with finding the ability to accept uncertainty in the world. Well, I guess if I get cancer, I will seek the best treatment I can seek and I will do the best that I can to overcome it. If I lose my job, I will find another job or do the best I can to do that. If I have money troubles, I will do this. Like you can you can do that, but honestly, some things you are just trying to find certainty in through your worry. And the way that you get to be okay with that is to accept the worst possible outcome that there is. So for the things that do not have an action plan, that you cannot turn worry into action, it's just still pure worry, you are going to have to sit with yourself really quietly and say, okay, like I'll just assume that if that thing does happen, there's nothing I could do about it anyway because life is uncertain. I will deal with it when, I, when it happens and I will ride that wave when it comes. But worrying about it isn't going to help me. And the way you've got to do that, and I know that I sound like a broken record when I say these things, but learning to relax your body because you, body language is how you speak to fear and anxiety, learning to relax your body and learning to quiet your mind through a process of basic selective focus, breath centered meditation and mindfulness goes a very long way, a very long way. And let me try and explain if I can. When you are in a situation where right this minute you are worried right now, you're worried about what if I have a heart attack? What if I get cancer? What if my dog gets run over? Whatever it happens to be that you are worried about right now that cannot be turned into an actual plan, it's just pure worry, like pointless worry, you're going to have to say, when I get into this, where I'm worried, oh my God, what if, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to have to relax my body, just sit quietly and just go back and focus on my breath. Now, that sounds super simple, but if you are in a situation where your worry has escalated to the point where it is causing you anxiety and fear, that will be difficult to do because in your mind, if you are excessively worried about, you know, your beloved pet falling ill or, or getting in an accident and you, your response to that is to stop responding to that thought and to just go limp and to just take some time and, and quietly breathe and focus on your breath, you are essentially surrendering to that worst case scenario in your head. So it's very similar to the way we approach having a panic attack or feeling like physical anxiety symptoms. You are very much surrendering to the worst thing that you could think will happen. Because in the end, what you think worrying is doing is it's a protection mechanism. If I think about it and worry about it, then I am doing something to keep myself safe from that horrible fate. But that's not true. So if you can say, well, I can choose to think about Fido, you know, getting in a terrible accident, Rover getting run over by a car, or I can just focus on my breath, you may find that you are incredibly uncomfortable when you do that. Maybe not at the level of like full-blown panic like many people would be because, because of panic issues. But if that makes you uncomfortable, then you are kind of on the right track because that worry is nothing more than a compulsion designed to keep you safe from that imagined outcome. So your response to worry is to really practice again and again and again being relaxed, slowing everything down, focusing on what you are doing at any given time. And you can learn to do that by first focusing on your breath and just quieting your mind. You cannot 
demand that your mind stop thinking. That's not what I'm talking about here. So learning the basic selective focus and meditation skill is not designed to shut off the worry switch immediately. It's designed to let it run in the background. That program will continue to run. You're just not hitting any keys on the keyboard anymore. So the program is still running. You're just not interacting with it to keep it going. So the more you do that, or the other way to think about it is, think of worry, just the same way we do with intrusive or obsessive thoughts, as the, a car going, going down the road. Like if you have your foot on the gas pedal, the car will continue to accelerate. If you take your foot off the gas, the car doesn't stop immediately, it continues to roll. It continues to move forward, just that you are not adding more momentum to it. You are not propelling it in any way. So when you learn to disengage with your worrisome thoughts and that worried state, what you're essentially doing is putting your worry in neutral. It will continue to roll forward because of the momentum that it has built over the hours, months, days, years of your life, whatever it is. But when you, you keep taking your foot off the gas and go into neutral mode, sooner or later, the worry does run out of momentum and it will come to a stop. Now, that's a hard new way to learn to be. And it may take you months of doing this over and over and over to really get to that point. But when you surrender and say, I'm just let those thoughts be there and I'm just going to go on with my day. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to focus on cooking dinner. I'm going to focus on writing this email. I'm going to focus on whatever it is I'm doing. I'm going to go back to my breath because it's always there. I'm just going to keep relaxing my body and over and over and over. You're essentially putting the worry cycle in neutral and just letting it run its course until it is done. But you are also like giving up a protection mechanism. So it will probably make you very uncomfortable to do that. And that's it. Like there's no magic to this. There really isn't. And when you learn that skill and you practice it, you, you can't only do these things when you get yourself all worked up and with worry. These are things that you should practice all the time, all the time. Two and three minutes at a time of, you know, belly breathing and basic meditations like the focus training, progressive muscle relaxation, all of those things. If you practice them three, four, five times a day, when you get up at lunch, at your lunch break, during the day, before you go to bed, like they just become a part of your routine. You get good at those skills and then you can implement them when you need to. So when you get yourself all worked up and you discover that you've spent the last three minutes, like going down the rabbit hole of worry about what might happen to your son or daughter, you can say, oh, wait, do this thing. And boom, you can kick in your, your, your basic meditation, your mindfulness, slow things down and let the thoughts continue to run because of their momentum. And then ultimately they will run out of momentum and you're good to go. So this is the way that we can learn to stop worrying. We can turn some of our worry into a plan, put the plan in place, rehearse it and have it ready and then drop it or learn to disengage, you know, the parts of worry that are unactionable because you, there's no action you could take in response. You know, those things you can learn to overcome by just putting the worry cycle into neutral and letting it like run its course and run out of momentum on its own through practice. So in both of those cases, miraculously, what you are doing, if you take some of your worry subjects and turn them into plans and learn the other unactionable subjects just you learn to relax and to surrender to and let them peter out on their own, what are you doing? Like after six months or so, maybe less, maybe more, you don't have to tell people that you're a warrior anymore. And guess what? If you are not a warrior anymore, you don't worry about them or you or whatever the heck it is, is that you worry about, you're still the same person you are. Maybe a little bit better, a little bit more balanced, a little more focused, a little stronger, if you will. You'll have learned a lot of great lessons, but you'll be the same person that you always were. You will still love your son, your daughter, your husband, your friends, your dog. You'll still be the same good person or crappy person that you've always been. You know, maybe we all have flaws we got to work on. But in the end, worry does not define you as a person. It can be left behind. So when you wrap this all together, the last 23 minutes that I've been talking, we can understand what worry is, the difference between worry and planning, how to take some of the worry out of your life by turning it into plans, and then why you don't have to worry. That, that self-applied label of I am a warrior not only doesn't have to be there, but you can, through some planning and some surrender to your worry, learn to not be a warrior anymore. And, and there you go. So hopefully I have given you an understanding, at least in my worldview, of what worry is and why it's pointless and kind of unhealthy and how you can reframe it and the things that you can do to get out of the worry cycle. Okay, guys, so that is the topic of worry in a nutshell. Hopefully it's been useful and you got something out of it. I appreciate you coming by today. 
theanxioustruth.com slash 91. That will contain all the show notes for this particular episode. And theanxioustruth.com slash links will get you to the podcast, the website, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and especially the Facebook group. So if you're on Facebook, join the group. Because when you ask questions and leave comments there, you get feedback from more than just me. It's chock full of excellent people and excellent information. One more thing I'm going to ask, a favor. If you're listening on iTunes or whatever podcast network you like, maybe take a second and leave like a five-star you know, rating. Or maybe take another second or two after that and write a very quick review of the podcast and why you like it. If you're getting something out of it, that helps other people find it too. So I really appreciate it if you took the time to do that. And again, thanks for coming by. Hope you enjoyed it. And I will see you guys in the next one. Somebody told me that you do or die But I believe all you can do is try And as the city stands ten stories high I'm gonna live my life It's all around you, you can breathe it in And this is where your story begins You got the feeling that you're gonna win yeah, you're on your way It's in the afterglow It's in the lyrics of the songs we know It's in these feelings that you never show Yeah, you're doing fine Hey, what's up guys? Drew here. In the five years that I've done the podcast, I've never had a sponsor. But now it's time for me to put in a little plug for the day job, the business that I own. And that business is managed WordPress hosting. So if you have a website and it runs WordPress and you'd like WordPress hosting that makes WordPress faster, more secure, and way easier than you ever imagined it would be, then check out Helix. You can find us online at imhelix.com. That's I-A-M-H-E-L-I-X.com. We took a long time to build Helix. I'm super proud of it. It works spectacularly. We take really good care of our customers, and I promise we would take really good care of you too. So if you're in the market for WordPress hosting that will blow your mind, check out Helix. I would appreciate the consideration. I thank you for coming by and listening, and I'll see you the next time.